And we are back again with another episode number 67 on the Daru Strong Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Daru. And you can see if you're watching on YouTube, I am rocking my Raiders hat, the newly formed Las Vegas Raiders. And they smashed the Ravens this weekend. So I'm very happy about that. I'm going to continue this thing. I've been a Raiders fan since shit, I don't know how long. But I'm glad that they are back and ready to go. You see Bruce Buffer over there starting it up, starting the whole game up. So they got a good Vegas feel, a good UFC feel to the Raiders nation. So I'm happy about that. Anyways, getting back to the subject at hand. Today is going to be a Q&A section, a Q&A style, I should say, of the podcast. I'm going to go over several different questions I got on my Instagram. I'm going to talk about you know, when it comes down to coaching, when it comes down to scheduling, when it comes down to all things that have to do with strength and conditioning. So make sure you stay tuned, make sure you stay locked in and be ready for some knowledge bombs that I'm gonna drop on you guys. Now, before we get into it, I'm gonna go ahead and shout out the sponsors. VivoBarefoot.com is the shoe that I have been rocking for over a year now and I can truly say that even myself and all my athletes have gained a large amount of functionality in our feet and our lower limbs by wearing this particular shoe. And they just came out with a new shoe, right? Boom, right there. If you guys can't see it on YouTube. The new style Geo Racer Knit is out now and they just blessed me with my own pair. So I'm very happy to go ahead and try these out. But if you want to go ahead and get you some, go ahead to VivoBarefoot.com. Use the discount code DeRueStrong at your checkout and you'll get 10% off your final purchase. Also, if you're looking to learn from some of the brightest and best minds in the business of fitness and strength and conditioning, I highly recommend you come check out the Daru Strong Conference at the end of the year here in Boca Raton, Florida. Just added guest speakers, Joe DeFranco, Jordan Shallow, and also Bo Hightower. So you guys definitely want to make sure that you're here to learn and to grow with all the information that you're going to be getting and gathering here at the Daru Strong Conference, December 11th through the 12th. If you want to find out more details, go to my website, DaruStrong.com, to get your tickets now for the end of the year blowout conference. All right, now let's do this podcast. Mind somewhere else and keep going. That little voice in your head is trying to stop you from getting to where you want to be. Be successful and keep moving forward. With your host and world renowned strength and conditioning coach, Phil Delru. All right, guys, episode number 67, Daru Strong Podcast. Today we're going to do an Instagram QA style. Today uh, I, I asked you guys to send me over your questions on IG. So I'm going to take a few of the best questions that I see here that'll give you the most value. So let's start off with the first question. Uh, you mentioned a while ago in one of your videos that you were dealing with tennis elbow. How did you fix it? So I've been dealing with tennis elbow for a while, especially when it came down to powerlifting, right? So when you're powerlifting and you're trying to lift maximal load, that's the sport, um, you're gonna try to put your body in the best position, right, from a from a positioning standpoint, you're gonna try to get as tight as possible. So what I'm doing inside of a squat is I'm actually grabbing the bar as close to my shoulders as possible, and that's gonna put a huge amount of external torque on the shoulders and on the elbow. And I ended up getting a large amount of tendinopathy and tendinitis in my elbow, on the outside of my elbow here. So that's basically what they would call tennis elbow. And what I would do was, was basically First, you want to decrease inflammation. So yes, you can ice it, um, but that's not going to be the end all be all. That's kind of a, a quick fix in the beginning, but it's not going to stop it from happening ever again. So ice in the beginning. And then the main thing that you want to do from a preventative standpoint is to increase your range of motion. So increase the uh, ro rotation 
of the elbow itself. So doing things like controlled articular rotations and progressive and regressive angular isometrics are definitely gonna be important. So as you do want to increase your supination or your external torque and your ability to rotate that, that elbow as appropriately as possible without compensating through the shoulder and just the entire arm itself. So working on your range of motion, working on your mobility of your elbow is gonna be important. And then when you have that issue, let's say for instance, you just started getting that, uh, that tendonitis built up, you can start doing high repetition banded uh, tricep extensions. That's what I've done um, to warm up my elbow, especially before the squat or the bench. And that has helped me a lot because basically what you're trying to do is increase restoration, right? Trying to get blood flow in there. And you're also working the range that you need to and pumping the muscle full of blood that surrounds that tendon. So you're giving it nutrients and then you're also priming the body or priming the arm to do the movement ahead, whether it be isometrically contracting in a squat variation or doing a press movement like a bench press or an overhead press. So usually that's gonna be high reps. So you're looking at like 50 to 100 reps before you actually get on to the bench or the squat or whatever you're doing. Um, when it comes down to um, ballistic or dynamic movements like punching a, a heavy bag, something like that, I would recommend you getting some soft tissue work done on it. So around the tissue, so the brachia, brachial radialis, brachialis, um, and then also just deep into the wrist too as well. Your forearm muscles in general, you wanna go ahead and get some, uh, get some soft tissue work done on that. You can use a lacrosse ball, or you, if you have a massage therapist, um, you can utilize them as well too. And then from there, you wanna create tension or you wanna create um, compression. So what you wanna do is you wanna wrap that elbow either with an elbow sleeve or some type of uh, wrapping, whether it be um, an ace bandage or even, um, even like a knee sleeve or an elbow sleeve it would be really good. And then from there, you can go through your movements. Now that compression is gonna keep it nice and stable. Um, it's gonna protect the joint and it'll protect the tendons from any further damage. And it also feels good too as well. So using that while you're doing those ballistics type movements, doing the bench press or even hitting a heavy bag will definitely allow you to still do the movement. Again, it's not gonna be the end all be all. It's not gonna fix the issue. Um, truly fixing the issue is laying off of the, that particular movement that has hurt it before, working on range of motion, and then also working on those high rep sets of band um, extensions. So try that out. It's definitely gonna be a process, usually recovering from some type of ten, tendon issue, um, like a tennis elbow is gonna take usually a good six to even 12 months um, for the most part. So you gotta make sure that you're working around it, but also working to improve upon it. All right, next question. All right, so the next one, same person. Talk about the little nagging injuries that you've had and how you trained around it. So if you guys have been following me on my Instagram, you know that you know I've had knee surgeries, I had ankle sprains, and I'm still dealing with one now. For me, my goal is always gonna be to progress. No matter what it is, whatever setback I may have, I'm working around it based upon what I know I can do. So you can only control the controllables and the things that you can do is, again, anything that's not gonna put your body in a bad position, it's not gonna hurt you even more. So because I had the ankle injuries for the past two weeks, I've been working the upper body, but I've been laying off of any pressure on my ankles. So you can do open chain movements, you can do things that are going to still enhance all the other muscles that surround it, um, but we're not putting pressure on the injured ligament or tendon or, or muscle, whatever have you. All right, working around it just takes uh, a conscious understanding of what you need to do, your, your goals and the progress that you, or the progress that you want to attain. Um, progressing doesn't just have to be, you know, single track minded. It doesn't have to be cyclical. You can work around things and make sure that you're getting what you need done no matter the situation. So think about it like that, right? So if you have, for me, like I said, with the elbow injury, right? With the elbow issue, the tendonitis issue, we still worked around it. Um, I got stronger, but I stayed away from the exercises that were hurting it until I got to the position where it wasn't hurting anymore and I wasn't causing any more damage to it. But at the same time, I was working to recover from it. 
So working on your mobility, working on or getting some soft tissue work done, getting some physical therapy done. And then all throughout that time frame, you're still getting stronger throughout the entire body. So make sure that you're taking that into account. All right, next question. Okay, short SNC workouts after MMA training. So rope skipping, drilling, bag work, and, uh, and he wants to do this four days a week. He asked me if that was okay. When you're doing small exercises or, or small workouts, I should say, you can do that every 12 to 24 hours. So, you know, jumping rope, drilling, uh, bag work, pad work, all that stuff can be done um, directly after your strength and conditioning workouts. Or I would, for me, I would space it out at least two to three hours apart. Um, if your focus is primarily working on your skills training to get better as a mixed martial artist or a boxer or a combat sport athlete, you want to make sure that you're doing that first because you don't want to be tired or fatigued doing your skills training, right? So put the emphasis on what's most important and what you need to work on to fill in the gaps and make sure that that's a priority first before you go out and do anything else that you already have. So if you're a strong guy, if you're athletic, you come from an athletic background, you played sports all your life, but you're just getting into combat sports and you're learning how to throw strikes and grapple and throw up submissions and things like that, you wanna try to get in your skills training first in the day, right? Where you're somewhat fresh and so that you can increase your abilities going further. Then you can go ahead and do your strength and conditioning. So it really just depends on the athlete and where they're at, you know, as far as their abilities goes. As far as frequency, again, you can do four days a week. You can, honestly, a lot of guys will even go all the way up to six days a week. I like one day a week at, at, at the least to get full recovery. So, you know, I'd say two days would be ideal with that one day being an active recovery day and the, and the second day of your, of your recovery day being a, a passive recovery day where you're pretty much not doing anything, um, but, you know, obviously maintaining your diet and doing some things around the house or, or going, you know, spending time with family. But other than that, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you're passively recovering as much as possible because the next day throughout that week is going to be intense. So just got to take that into account. Next question. Three days of MMA and two days of powerlifting in one week. Can I gain significant strength with this program? So it depends on your goals, right? If you're, if you're trying to be a better powerlifter, you want to get in more frequency of training. So three to four days a week would be more advantageous for you if you're actually being a powerlifter, right? Um, and you're doing MMA on the side. Now, if you're an MMA athlete and you're trying to get stronger, two days a week that we've seen over experience has been plenty because not only are you doing or you're getting stronger in your weight training, but you're also going to get stronger throughout your grappling, throughout your wrestling and throughout your MMA training in general. So there is some weighted resistance from external forces, whether that be, you know, a barbell, a dumbbell, a kettlebell or your your training partners. So you got to take that into account and figure out what's more important. What are you actually focusing on? Are you focusing on being a power lifter or are you focusing on being an MMA athlete? So with that being said, I would look at it like that as opposed to looking at it like, OK, am I going to get stronger doing a powerlifting program with MMA and vice versa? All right. So next question. Any advice for how to balance BJJ training for a marathon and strength and conditioning? So this goes back to that original question that I just talked about with balancing the powerlifting and MMA. You need to find out exactly what you're focusing on. So when I started training for powerlifting, I was only focusing on powerlifting. I wasn't doing really any MMA training. You know, I wasn't doing anything else that was going to take me away from the end goal, which was being successful in that particular sport. Now, with that being said, can you train some BJJ while you're you know, trying to run a marathon or trying to train for a marathon? Yes, but the focus of whatever you're trying to do needs to be congruent to the end goal. So if you're actually competing or looking to complete a marathon and that's the, the full focus, that needs to be what you're really looking to schedule your training around. So... And, and again, it goes for that with BJJ. If you're looking to compete in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but you're using marathon training as a means to get your conditioning, well, you want to focus your Jiu-Jitsu training first and then work around that with marathon training or running. So it goes down to scheduling. It comes down to it, I should say. And for that, I would say not knowing exactly the full context of your, of your question, I would have to tell you First, find out exactly 
what the end goal is. Is it being a better marathon runner? Is it being a better Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner? Or is it just getting overall fit? And then from there, you can kind of correlate the scheduling. You can put together a solid program that's going to keep you in line with the ultimate goal. All right. So, yes, it can be done. But for the most part, look at what's the most important thing and focus on that most important thing and then work the schedule around the, I guess you would say, the non-important or sub-important aspects of your training. Any advice for rehabbing from a fractured ankle? So I never fractured my ankle, so I, I uh, thank God for that. But I could say with a numerous amount of sprained ankles and problems with the lower limbs, you know, before anything, obviously, if it's a, a bad fracture, you're going to have to get it taken care of. You're going to have to get it. Uh, re, um, you're going to have to get it worked on. And if that's the case, you have to wait until you fully heal. So either you're getting surgery, right, and you're mending back that fracture. Then from there, you want to find a PT, a physical therapist, a doctor of physical therapy that can start to rehab you back to sport play and then once you get to that level for me being a strength and conditioning coach i would primarily focus on strengthening up the surrounding muscles that support the ankle so looking at the gastroc the soleus the anterior tib you want to start strengthening that and you also want to start strengthening up the foot so doing things like short foot walking barefoot um cone drills things like that I have, a, I have a system that I got from Pete Bomarito. It's called the Support System Prep. And from there, what we would do is basically dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and working in those ranges, and then loading those ranges with high dynamics to low dynamics and back and forth. And what that's gonna do basically is that's gonna help you propel. That's gonna strengthen up the surrounding muscles that, that support the ankle like I talked about. And then things like calf raises and toe raises are definitely going to be um, advantageous for you. So I would work on that and slowly progress it over time. You want to get range of motion first and foremost, so bringing down the swelling. Then from there, you want to start to increase the active end range control and the strength in those end ranges and then start working into full range of motion so that now you can build up some hypertrophy, so build up some muscle, and then also build up some strength and stability there. And this can take depending on you, right? So it, it can take up to, you know, six to 12 months, like we talked about um, with, the, uh, with the elbow issue, same concept. So it is a slower process, but it all depends on you and how you take to the exercises and your recovery. All right, next question. All right, so this one's a good one. How do you increase running mileage and speed? And speed meaning the distance you can cover in a significant amount of time for long distance runners. Um, the thing that helped me the most was working through mathetone running. So math running or math training. And that's taking your, your, you're taking your age, right? So you're doing 180 minus your age and you're running within that, that heart rate range. So for me, it was staying right around 148 to 150 beats per minute and doing that in a sustainable amount of time. So we would start off with 20 to 30 minutes, then we'd work our way up to 45 to 60 minutes, and then that would be just a slow linear progression. The goal is to obviously cover distance, more distance over that time frame at that same heart rate range. So that's really good to increase your aerobic capacity, your ability to take in oxygen, utilize that oxygen, deliver it to the surrounding tissue, and then also just building up the gas tank in general. Um, so I would say mathetone running, or you can also play around with zone two running. So lower intensity, longer duration running has definitely helped me increase my overall mileage. All right. And then you can start to do fart lick training, things like that, intervals, hard intervals, working the aerobic power systems um, for that. You know, that's going to be more higher up into the higher VO2 max ranges. So you're looking right around 80, maybe even 85% into that range and sustaining that range. Those are gonna be interspersed with those intervals. So you're gonna speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. And with the intervals being either two minutes to five minutes to sometimes even 10 minutes long. And that could be in through distance or that could be through time. So, but I would first start off with mathetone running and then work your way into those higher intensity intervals. All right, steps to becoming strength and condition, a strength and conditioning coach. 
um, asking me about education, cert certifications, etc. So the proper steps, you know, it depends on what you want to do, right? If you want to work in the college setting or the professional setting, working for a team, um, you're definitely going to have to get a graduate degree, master's or PhD. You want to do some type of internship or GA spot. You want to get in with a strength and conditioning coach in your college or university and then start to work into that system, right? If you're looking more in the private sector, trying to build your business and do something like what I've done, um, you definitely still want to have that baseline level of education. So you want to learn, you know, the basics of physiology, biomechanics, physics, things like that, that can correlate over to other things. As far as certifications go, you want to definitely have a nationally accredited certification. So NSCA, ISSN, ISSA, um, NASM, all those are really good. And then you want to start working into finding out, you know, once you get established and you start to get some experience in the weight room with actual athletes, you can start doing those weekend courses, right? Um, FRC is definitely one thing that's take me to the next level when it comes down to mobility. Um, PRI is also a good one. And then some other, you know, C, I think, I think what is it? CPPS, Joe DeFranco's certification, definitely a good one when it comes down to practicality. Um, you know, Joe DeFranco and Smitty definitely have a great curriculum there that actually shows you how to coach as opposed to just taking things from a book and trying to implement them out. So that's one thing that a lot of young coaches don't realize is more so about communication skills. It's also knowing when to push and when to pull back. Um, exercise selection based on the individual's uh, prerequisites and also understanding of what is needed. Programming and periodization, all those great things come into play once you can first understand what you have in front of you. And then from there, communicating that appropriately so that you can have a positive outcome with that athlete. All right, so those are the steps that I would take. And then from there, you know, if you are looking to do something in the private sector, build your business, own a gym, things like that, that's gonna take a huge amount of grind. You're gonna be in there for hours and hours at the gym and then it doesn't stop when you go home because then you have to program and then you have to look and study more. So it's gonna take you a good amount of time. It's not gonna be overnight. You know, I've been doing this for 12, 13, actually 14 years now. Um, and I'm still trying to learn and get better and progress. You know, I have coaches now that are under me and that way I can actually teach. And the way that I learn more is actually through teaching. So this definitely does help. If you are looking to uh, get some more knowledge, um, I would definitely check out my mentorship program. We have over 900 coaches in the mentorship from around the world, and we're learning from each other each and every day. So mentorship is, uh, is down in the link below. You can also go to my website, jerustron.com. When, when do you find time to like study? Like when, when are you? That's a very good question. When are you able to get it in? Because every time I see you or speak to you, you always have some something new that you bring. Mm -hmm. You yeah. just had old information. It's always something that can help someone else. So, and then how do you decipher um, what's good information that's for you? Yeah. And. And what's just throw out. Yeah. Sometimes I get to the point where it's like, all right, I need to almost forget the old to bring in the new. And I have to figure out what's most important at that particular time. I got a lot of questions on that. Like, how do you know what to learn mm -hmm. first? Because there's so much information now that's readily available. Google, right? All that stuff is, is right there at your fingertips, literally at your fingertips. Where it wasn't like that, you know what, 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have that access, yeah. you know? So now it's kind of ciphering through, okay, what do I actually need to focus on? So it takes a, a huge amount of self-awareness first. Like, what do I suck at, mm -hmm. you know? And then what do I actually want to learn to get better in my career? So you've seen my book, man. I, when, I, when I schedule out everything, it's, it's to the T, every 30 minute blocks, maybe even 15 minute blocks. Mm -hmm. So if I have a time that I know that I can get in, whether, even if it's 10 minutes and I get on you know, YouTube or I, get, you know, through, I go through Google or I find my book that I've been trying to you know, read through, depending on what I'm trying to learn at that particular time, I'm going to find that time when I'm driving. I have a long way you know, from the gym to home, right? I'm always looking to learn. So audio books, Blinkist I think is a phenomenal app that you can cipher through all that. So 
it's a it's an actual app that basically takes the highlights of all the books and it goes through it within like 15 to 20 minute span so you can take a book that may take you you know if you're looking at an audible it may take you 11 hours but you can get through it in 15 20 minutes because it gets through all the fluff which is really good especially for myself when i'm trying to get that information out there i'm trying to get through all the bullshit all right so another question Mm -hmm. with that being said and being able to have the information right there at your fingertips and it's almost like a a microwave society do you feel that that's a a good like because you you just said it's a good but like i can see it sometimes being um like everyone's always rushing to sure yeah 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 there's 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 times where you should sit and read Mm -hmm. there's times where you do need to get the full understanding of certain things that's why i always say you definitely want to use something like Blinkist, but you should read the entire book. Yeah. It just, again, it's just what times do you have? Mm-hmm. If I have time to sit down and actually go through it and absorb it and enjoy it, then yeah, we'll do it. And I actually do both, mm-hmm. right? So I'll take the one, I'm like, okay, just like highlighting. Yeah. It's the same thing. If you highlight a book, the same concept. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, boom, I got Blinkist, you know, whatever it be. Um, and, and then from there, I'll take the regular book and I'll just go through it. And then I'll highlight what was on Blinkist because I see it in the book. I'm like, oh, there it is. Boom. And I'll highlight and make sure I go back to it. Because once you read it once, well, again, you're going to want to read it again and again and again to go back and reference it. Right? And if I don't reference it, then I can't let it stick. And that's for me. You know me, man. I've been concussion central. You know what I'm saying? So, like, having the ability to go back and see exactly what was most important in that particular chapter mm-hmm is that's just like the best thing possible, right? Because now you're fully absorbing the information. Again, you could read you could read a book like Super Training, right? But if you don't absorb that knowledge, you just wasted your time just reading things, right? Just words. So it's all about absorbing that information and then putting it to good use, right? Whether it be in actionable steps or regurgitating it to a degree to where people understand it in, a, in an appropriate manner. So like a good way to teach is to first understand what you've learned and then being able to teach it to anybody from a first grade level all the way up into a Harvard grad, mm-hmm. right? And that's really where true wisdom comes from, like is the ability to transition it back and forth. All right, so <clears throat> like, I'm, I'm, I just- Let's do it, let's do it. All right, so like with, with wisdom, you just mentioned that. Um, when you're what what could you offer to the audience like if keep someone that's facing adversity right now like what's something what are some steps that you do when you're feeling down when you're like yeah man i don't know you need a, so you need a win you need a small win um i i could tell you i've been hit a few times in the past month with adversity you know but those small wins allow you to pick yourself up a little bit more and start to get that momentum going forward. And so you wanna find something that you know you can accomplish. It's, it's obviously going to be a hard situation, whether it be going to, the, going to the weight room and knocking out a set or two, right? Um, going for a run, you know, something that's physically and mentally going to challenge you, but can be easily attained, right? Through hard work, through effort, right? So as I get that win, then I start to create more momentum. Then I start to feel more self-worth. Then learning new things, another win, right? If, even if it's just one thing in that day, I got better. So the whole thing is when you get setbacks, you ultimately feel like you're taking a step back. And from there, you have to stop yourself and realize that there's more to it. So I take a step back, you look at it, you detach yourself from the situation, then you start to realize, okay, I can, I can take this bad situation and turn it into good. We're learning from that situation, learning from, you know, okay, like when I got in that car accident just recently, right? Understanding like, yo, maybe I should be more aware of my overall surroundings, right? So then that, that particular moment, I just got better. So I found out because I learned from the situation. So that's a win. Right? Even though it's a setback based off a situation, it's still a win because I learned from the, from the whole thing, the whole circumstances. Um, let's say, for instance, you get an injury. Well, now, like when I had the ACL tear, right? I didn't take it as, oh, shit, I'm not going to be able to train and I'm going to you know, be out for you know, so long. I took it as an understanding, 
good. Now I get to understand how to actually rehab and prepare not only for the surgery, but getting better after the surgery, right? So I took it as a learning experience and I took it as a means to getting stronger mentally and physically because I'm going to go through some hardship. I'm going to go through that pain and that pain is going to direct me to being stronger. So again, like I always say, like, you know, with strength, if you're trying to build strength, you have to suffer a little bit, right? You have to go through that painful situation. In order for you to grow, you have to go through those setbacks because you, the adaption, if you don't have the positive um, understanding of what can happen after the fact, then you'll never adapt. You ultimately let it drag you down deeper and deeper. So for that, I'm gonna take those bad situations, I'm gonna learn from it, I'm, an, I'm going to adapt to that negative situation and turn it into a positive. Right. You know that. <laughs> I love that shit though. Like I wait for it. So what do you recommend a fighter eats and trains the week after a fight? Now, everybody asked me before a fight, so this is the week after. So no matter how the fight went, if you knocked the guy out or submitted the guy or girl within the first minute or you went through a three to five round war, you still need to take a week off. Because of the fact that you just put your body through eight to 12 weeks of pure camp where you were going through and training nonstop, getting ready, not only physically, but emotionally and mentally for your opponent and going through, you know, the arduous task of having to go through multiple sessions throughout the days and weeks. So for that, you need to let your body recover. You need to let your nervous system recover. And I would take a full week off. Now, with that being said, you can still train, but keep it light. Keep it very light. Keep it playful. Um, not a whole lot of tension. We're talking about the weight room. You just want to get in there and get, get like a pump, right? Almost like a bodybuilding style of training. Not to the degree of actually going to true failure, but just getting there and moving around, right? Moving your body um, around from a global perspective. When you're talking about you know your your skills training, just want to go in there, hit pads, maybe hit the bag a little bit, flow roll, you know, uh, drill, you know, light drilling, things like that. Keep it very light and I guess non intense to a degree, right? You know, after that, you can start to work in into a transition phase where you start working more general physical preparedness, start to increase your fitness a little bit more, start to increase strength, maybe a little bit of hypertrophy. And as far as your skills training, then you can start to slowly progress into those higher intensities. I wouldn't start sparring, you know, until, you know, you probably have a fight booked and you're ready for another camp. But you can still go in there and do some tech sparring and help your, your teammates out if needed. Okay. As far as eating goes, obviously I'm not the uh, expert on you know diet nutrition, but for the most part, what I would say is you don't want to you know kill kill the kill the Burger King or kill McDonald's, right? You don't want to go out there and try to eat everything that you couldn't eat for the entire camp and stuff yourself every meal, right? So what you want to do is what's called reverse dieting. So you're going to take yourself out of that caloric deficit slowly. So you're going to start to slowly increase your calories over time. And you'll do that in a week by week basis, right? So somewhere around 500 to about 800 calories per week increasing over that time frame. And you never want to get anywhere higher than 20 pounds over your scale weight of your fight. So make sure that you're taking that into account. And you're also keeping your body fat percentage into that lower range, right? So usually primarily we tell male athletes never to get anywhere above, you know, 12 to 13 percent body fat. Females, you don't want to get anywhere higher than, you know, 16 to 20 percent body fat. So just keep it there. Um, you, you still need some body fat to help you with recovery, to help you with, you know, not getting injured, things like that, and, and energy production too as well. But you don't want to have too much. And I know you guys are going to say, what about Daniel Cormier and, and all those guys? Listen, they've been athletes all their life with that amount of weight on their body. But if you're talking about true health and you're talking about being as optimal as possible, you want to get to a lower body fat percentage so that it's functional for your body to move around and not have that added weight on you. It's the same thing if you had over amounts of muscle, right? Your heart doesn't know any better. It still has to pump, right? It still has to work hard to carry your body around. So again, you want to make sure that you're in a healthy weight range. 
So without access to an assault bike, how can we test VO2 max and maximal aerobic power at our local gym? Um, so your VO2 max, you would have to get a either a portable metabolic cart or you'd have to go to a university to get it tested. Um, you can use a beep test too as well. It's not highly accurate, but from a field-based perspective, you can utilize it. All you need is you know, an open space, whether it be a football field or a basketball court, something like that. And um, you can use that. So a beep test for VO2 max. And then for your MAP, your maximum aerobic power, if you don't have an assault bike, you can also use a watt bike. Um, you, can use a, you can use a row machine, and you can also use a ski erg if you're just trying to work the upper body. So there's there's several ways you can do it if you don't have a, a, a quote unquote assault bike, you know, an airdyne bike, whatever. Um, you can definitely use a watt bike. You can use a stationary bike uh, to a degree. I wouldn't I wouldn't probably do that if I had a if I had a pick between the three. Um, so a watt bike or a a row machine, which is what I would choose. So the main tips for people trying to follow in my footsteps as a trainer. Um, the one thing I would say is I don't want people to follow in my footsteps. If anything, even my son, I want my son to you know, pave his own way. So for that, I'm going to tell you, don't look at me as, as a means of trying to get to where I'm at. Try to get to where you want to go based on your own circumstances. Right? Now, with that being said, the goal, like anything, and it's going to sound cliche as shit, but you have to put in effort. You have to work your ass off. Like, for me personally, things will come once you consistently put in effort day in and day out and you don't look at the scoreboard. I hate when people actually stare up and try to look at what they've accomplished. At the end of the day, it's still going to be your set. It's still going to be your time to do work. It's still going to be your time to get in and get after it. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished. It's what you've got to accomplish going further. So you have plenty of time to progress. Don't think that you have to get it right then and there. Be patient, but be persistent, right? Don't, keep, don't be complacent. There's a difference. You, know, you have to constantly work, but again, don't think that it's going to be an overnight thing. So being patient in your pursuit in the actionable goal, right? Being able to consistently put out effort and do that with a clear mind and a clear conscience that you're going to get where you need to be. But for right now, the focus is what's in front of me. And then from there, you can start to steamroll it going forward. Be patient, be persistent. I would say elude complacency and make sure that you always are looking to get better through whatever means of professionalism that you're trying to accomplish. All right, last question. Who is the most challenging athlete I've ever trained? Challenging meaning difficult as far as maybe not taking to the training, not taking to my direction. Um, I haven't had that issue too much, uh, especially with my MMA guys. Um, a lot of them understand the process, know me, know what I'm trying to do with them is going to be beneficial for them. Um, I would say without a doubt, it's going to be the youth athletes for the most part, uh, especially the younger kids. When I was just starting out, I had a class of, I would say, seven or eight year olds that really had a hard time obviously paying attention. So I had to realize real quick that I had to make the training fun and I had to grab their attention right away. So with that, you know, if you have youth athletes, if you have young kids that you're training, make sure you make it enjoyable and you make the learning process enjoyable so that yes, they're learning, they're understanding how to move their body and you know, train appropriately, but also making it to where they're not actually sitting in a classroom learning about English, math, and reading, right? You wanna make training fun for them so that it can stick, right? It can be a long-term thing. It could be a lifestyle for them to adopt going further. So whether that be playing games, but having a correlation to getting them stronger. You know, I used to do things like relay races. Um, we used to do uh, 
tug of war. We used to do uh, competitions to where who could do the most pull-ups, who could do the most push-ups, who can you know hold the the longest plank. And the competition, and then from there I would give them you know I would give them prizes if they would win, or I would give the people that lost. I'd give them extra something, whether it be extra burpees or extra sprints, something like that. So it actually showed them that winning does pay and then you have to put in the effort and that will pay too as well. Now, if the guys and girls gave me good effort, then I would lessen the, uh, the damage, I would say, if they lost. But for the most part, you wanna make sure that you're putting positive affirmations into them and you're making sure that they're having an enjoyable, uh, enjoyable, environment to train from right so again make it enjoyable make them stay in complete understanding of what you're trying to accomplish keep them focused on the on the goal itself and also keep it fun and so for that i would say that's the most challenging would be the kids and once i found out how to do that it made it a lot easier for me to coach them up all right, guys, so that's it. That's all I have for you today, all the questions. Thank you so much for watching and listening. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel and like it, and also share it. If you're listening, iTunes, iHeartRadio, make sure you subscribe to that because I will be coming out with new podcast episodes each and every week, either myself or a guest, and also check out the past guests that I had on in the past episodes too as well. Thanks again for watching or listening, and I'll see you again next time.